Namaste. So these are puja days and uh, obviously fight is going on <laughs> within, without. And sometimes people become very anxious because they feel every um, fight they feel is third world war going to come. Well, um, that part is very clear. Mother has said that because of the supramental action, it is going to prevent the third world war. Yes, war may become widespread, but third world war in the way we conceive of it, the way the first and second world war took place, certainly not. Even logically, because now every country knows that um, if it presses beyond a point using the nuclear armament, it means doom, even for the country which uses it. So there will be no victory after that. And what's a fought for victory, for supremacy? This does not mean that there won't be large-scale conflicts. They are going to be there. Because there are many unresolved issues which are buried inside the earth. So often people ask that it's the age of truth, but where do we see it? Now, yes, we see it at several points, but that's right now not the issue. But before truth can come, there has to be, it is the age of justice, which will open the way for truth. That's how we see the Mahabharata war, which opened the way for truth. And um, as I have just learnt, <laughs> it's the sign of Libra, <laughs> balance, justice. So justice uh, seems to be the widespread cry of humanity everywhere. And it's taking very weird forms. Even forms where injustice is justified through form decrees. So let's see some of the forms it has taken. For instance, many things of the past... Uh, there is a kind of thought which says, how does it matter? What have happened in the past? Because those people are dead and gone. Those times are dead and gone. Now we are living in a different age and you know we need not concern ourselves with the past. The past never dies so easily. It is buried in the subconscious. That's what we see in Savitri, that there is a... The last battle is fought in the subconscious, where death takes her and shows that all these revolutions are buried here. So this clearance of the past is important, even in human life. You just can't say that, okay, it is yesterday what happened. Uh, this kind of thought which does that, but um, leaving aside a slate of thought. The fact is that past sticks to us like a phantom. That's how the law of karma is about, that whatever grooves along which we have moved tends to stick, uh, like something which is not there and yet there. <clears throat> like a phantom reality which forever tends to keep itself, like a mechanical groove in which uh, once nature has turned, it tends to keep that momentum. So there are many issues of the past which are going to come up and we see for instance in India we have these issues of the, uh, the, the masjids which were uh, built on destruction of temples. Now it is true, those people who destroyed are not there. Similarly, those people who build the temples are not there. But the states of consciousness that went into these acts, heinous acts, and the reactions and responses of human beings to these events, when they were helpless, now these will come up, take new forms, and they manifest themselves. Like it has been uh, foreseen somewhere that there was a prophecy about uh, uh, within India that uh, Karvas and Pandavas will come back again in the form of political parties. Their unfinished ambitions of the Karvas will, are going to manifest. Uh, similarly, we see that the present conflict that we are witnessing right now, one is the Ukraine and Russia, which we have spoken about, and then the uh, conflict of, I won't use the word Arab-Israel conflict, but the conflict of the Jews as a nation and the Muslim world. So, this world which is uh, the two worlds which are at conflict, we may call it the Arab-Israel conflict if you like, because the setting is in the Arab world. It has a long past history. And uh, very interesting, Shurabinda in one of his evening talks mentions that it has been prophesied that uh, when the Israelites, Israel, the Jews return to their homeland, then they, a golden era will begin for earth. So I find it very interesting, the prophecies, of course, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, what comes now today is the Bible, but the Old Testament. And actually, after some, I don't know, how many, 3,000, 3,500 years, 
they have come back in 1948 which is so close to the formation of israel and the formation of india is so close to each other and uh, so as a sign it is something very interesting uh, speaking of that we have a very interesting shared history of israel and uh, india which is, which is not cultural but experiential so the experiential part is that yes this land did belong to the you know the jews long long back before anybody else came i'm not going to go into that uh, whole history and they were taken that's where they heard the prophecy that well you have to obey the command of god if you obey life will be beautiful otherwise you will be driven out tortured persecuted everything but eventually you will return back and when you return back then yes life will be you know, progressed for you so that time this prophecy if you see that's the mount mount sinai where this prophecy was given so it very clearly belonged to that there were no muslims there were no arabs there were nothing and subsequently yes several conquests the babylonian empire the the uh, i don't think assyrians came but romans came and then uh, ottoman empire came and then the britishers came <laughs> so all this happened and during this period many of them most of them were driven out but always there were some people who didn't get converted and remained in india we face something very similar for the last 800 or even maybe 1000 years uh, we, except that we were not driven out maybe even if we look at kashmiri pandit there were six exoduses very similar to the israel uh, the jews who face several exoduses they were hated they were persecuted and they were hated because they are an intelligent race that's how the mother put it that people get jealous and uh, india the bhartiyas the, they were also hated and persecuted because people saw there is a great potential and they tried everything to undermine it so this is one of the ways that nations try to uh, have their hegemony over others and we see again the kashmiri pandits who bore the brunt most of them they went away but some did stay and didn't get converted it is also a fact but the rest of india because uh, india was too big a uh, thing to be swallowed so very similar history and same way we see that it changed hands uh, except that romans didn't come <laughs> they came in the new garb <laughs> but otherwise the greeks came and then uh, the mughals the muslims came and then the britishers came and again we see that um, indians who stayed here didn't get converted and they took the land back now there was a whole series of event they took the land back and a similar problem came up which we see today so one has to call out the problem as it is what is the problem now the palestinians or the arab world they, they never wanted a nation i don't want to go into all these aspects because we have to look at it from the spiritual standpoint but very simply the fact remains that this land did belong to the jews and mother says every nation has a right to exist so the logic that is applied here if we see the the terror groups uh, charter hamas they say that you know jews must be exterminated and it is there in the whole uh, uh, ideological belief system to which they owe their beliefs the same thing we see in gazba e hind which is equally that you know uh, uh, and and behind it is the idea that exclusivity uh, only my religion has the right and every land belongs to allah so what happens is that now because there was ottoman empire from which the britishers had taken rested power so the logic works in this way that this should have been handed over completely to the muslim because they are the inheritors of the ottoman empire even though the empire is gone so the caliphate should once again come back and the land should belong to it but before the ottomans they were romans before the romans they were babylonians before the babylonians they were jews and before the jews they were all human beings <laughs> so if you really look at it same logic is applied within india and this uh, this idea that if you create a separate state this is going to stop is pure merely a misconception because this india has gone through this was the idea two nation again we see britishers created this uh, confusion of two nations but here also we see that the two, two nations were created pakistan and india it doesn't work out why it doesn't work out simply because again in pakistan it owes to the muslim ideology i am I, i don't know whether all this is there in the quran or not but i believe that yes there must be something like that that's how things have come up the way they are i have not read i have read the quran i didn't find it fascinating i found it pretty um, well um, 
semi barbaric primitive in in my sense but that a part i can understand at some point of time desert people living among tribes it doesn't concern me but ideology is the same that once a land has been conquered by a muslim king it belongs forever to him so that is the whole logic behind ghazba e hind that now people who are in pakistan they are not happy they want the whole of india why because well it belonged to the moguls so britisher should have handed it back to the muslim see look at how the logic works moguls equals to muslim muslim and moguls common inheritance of islam uh, now this is the way this logic comes and how this logic gets supported as i said this war is taking place at many level and we can see that there is a kind of not modern post modern thought so these two kinds of thought streams came in in the previous century first which came in the first half of the previous century post uh, the first world war or even before that it started in 1890s and the modern thought modern thought slayed faith so it was a thought which was uh, skepticism is a way of life reason can give you the answer analyze and you shall find <laughs> so modern thought slayed faith tried to slay it <clears throat> post modern thought slayed reason how does it do it <laughs> it says all structures made by reason now you see you'll see a echo of a deep spiritual truth but inverted so all structuralism structures built by thought understanding they all are meaningless so that's why there is nothing like man and a woman in biologically so everything is simply a uh, has to be destroyed and subjectively you have to see things there is no objective reality and it appeals to a certain kind of uh, thought and there is in it a truth like everything there is a truth but a truth which has been like in communism there is a truth but a truth which is seen uh, through its shadow or or inverted so when you see the inverted truth if you say part by part you say yes 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 uh, if you describe a human being whether he is standing straight or whether he is uh, on his head you will have to give the same description except that you will start with probably two legs you you don't bring in the concept of space which actually post modern thought destroys concept of space concept of time which may look very spiritual but it is exactly how when we read savitri we we'll see death destroys these things and eventually leaves us in a vacuum so this is where we see today a post modern thought which has uh, taken a different form some day we'll give a talk on this so according to it uh, you see what what does it do now <laughs> it it i am giving an example uh, the right or wrong has to be decided on the number of dead bodies very strange so based on that in mahabharata the kauravas were right cuz they lost many more people than the pandavas ultimately their strength was much more so it has taken away all discriminative and discerning reason so you don't judge if you say that well this group has been involved with violent thing no you are being racist and one has to be very careful because it conceals a truth but it presents it at the in the hands of uh, you know death so that's why in savitri if you read savitri all these things become very clear savitri says oh death you are speaking the truth but a truth that slays and so she says that now i shall speak to you the truth that saves so we'll just read with this background the fact is the coming back of the jews to the land of israel now i'm not going into its political and other dimensions now bringing directly the spiritual angle to it which of course uh, with mother and shubindo of course uh, there is a way of spiritual thought that all this is maya i had a very strange um, person meeting me and saying but you know shankara has answered everything perfectly i said yes i know the answer that you are going to give i said is there an individual he said no i said so there is no discussion or anything he said all is brahman i said yes perfectly fine until somebody comes into your house takes a dagger and uh, puts it on your throat and then you say i am brahman you are brahman so this kind of absurdity is there so that's one solution which is no solution because india ended up with this kind of a thought that it fell and came under the spell of all this alien rule that was also needed in the part of the world play 
everything has its own place so one thing post modern thought is done it is a destructive thought it is destroying everything but it is not a creative thought so those who take it to be something like a new creation they are mistaken they think ah this is something very nice it's it's a new way of life it's not a new way of life it has destroyed the old ways of life and to that extent it has cleared the ground so what is the new way of life initially we will see fashion will come vital will say i'll create a new way of life wear um, uh, red socks in the right leg and <laughs> blue or no socks in the left so you, you know so well that's humanity will go through this phase it's the destructive thought which has come in the new creation is yet to begin but what we see today is the destruction of the past and most importantly justice so the jews through the persecution we cannot imagine what they must have gone through i mean in, in in india we have faced a similar issue now you can't suddenly come up one day and say they were different people all is fine all is clear let's meet together it can be done if the that consciousness is wiped off in both sides so one side holds this past that no everything belongs to us because from us you have taken then you can't uh, say to the other side that wipe of the past in fact it cannot be wiped off frankly it has to uh, be resolved and it will be resolved through the law of justice which is the strict universal determinism minimum of nature that's how the mother described it's the law strict logical universal determinism of nature now is the time that that's why can we imagine that five Words these people have won single-handedly. If I have to use a Hindi phrase, "chutku sanation," small little nation surrounded by a wall. How did this happen? So, of course, they they have they are very clever, very intelligent. But still, something supported that because there is so much of persecution that has gone in. They have gathered that strength through that era. Same thing has happened with India. so much of persecution over 800 years that suddenly when the indian strength is rebounding back people don't understand how is it that within a short time there is such an explosion of things because it is bouncing back with a vehemence with a vengeance and this is bound to happen because this has to repeat the issues which have to be resolved and this resolution cannot be from one side both sides have to come together both sides have to acknowledge their own uh, role they have played you can't say that other person is guilty and then the other person to accept that yes i am guilty both sides have to understand that we made mistakes but that's very difficult and humanity is still a phase away from that so these are conversations in 1967 we know this was a big trouble and time and uh, uh, a jew was um, you know he was killed in the olympics and this was part killed by a muslim so this was part of that whole thing which had started the wars which started almost immediately just like with india clashes took place the victories so uh, the mother says um, the world seems to be engulfed in a sort of violent chaos the disciples says they are fighting at the olympic games an athlete was killed by bullets and uh, this the mother's comment then the disciple says yes they killed an israeli mother says yes the arabs did it the disciple says these muslims really have something which is something that must disappear mother they are so fanatical we have a letter of shirbindo on fundamentalism which is written to a muslim disciple who wanted to do namaz five times here and shirbindo had to tell him look here if you are i have no issues if you want to practice this you if you find this religion superior you can go so he said but why is agarbatti allowed why is flowers allowed it had to be explained this is a spiritual sense within it now we have our own left liberal kind of thinking where we have stopped many of these things thinking it's a part of the post modern thought not realizing this can be a deeply spiritual act this is not religion but as i said that is something else we will talk about it so the disciple says they are so fanatical and the mother adds they are very violent so disciple says yes fanatical the mother once again says very violent 
So the disciple asks, I don't know what universal trait they symbolize, but they really seem to be. And the mother fills the blank force. And there is an aphorism of Sri Aurobindo that Christ manifested love without force. So they had to bring in that force element. And Muhammad manifested force without love and we may add without knowledge. And the mother made a comment that neither love alone nor force alone can change this world. That's why the new avatar which brings both power as well as love and of course wisdom. So she says force. So the disciple says, well, they spend their time stabbing each other. It's also true. They fight with each other. And mother says, you see, they firmly believe there is life after the body's death. The body's death to them is in no way the end of life. So the disciple says, they only believe in some sort of heaven, that's all. And the mother's very humorous remark, yes, murderers heaven. So let me stop here. <laughs> this is another conversation. Very interesting. Now she also describes the nature. So um, she says that Arabs have a very passionate nature. She says they are brothers. That's all Abrahamic religions. They came from Abraham and then their son and they uh, spread Noah's children who spread into different things and then Jacob who's 12 uh, children became 12 tribes of Israel. So they are actually brothers even if you go back historically. So, brothers have this love-hate relationship on who will get the whole, whole uh, father's entire property. And she also said Arabs are very passionate in nature and very violent. So, uh, now you see when you combine these two, it's a whole civilization which lives on extremes. Passionate people can be very extreme. If they can be very good, if they wish to, they can, you know, it's known that they dia. Pura, you know, give give everything. <laughs> Passionate nature. But equally, its extreme fanaticism can be, takes place with passionate natures. It, it is a kind of weakness in the vital. Whereas he says, the Jews are uh, Israelites, they are, uh, there is a little difference because Israel as a nation is based on Zionism, which is uh, the principles of nationalism based on that. So that's, not going into, as I said, all that is available everywhere. So I am not touching upon those issues. But yes, they are Jews. See, Israel, Israelites are very intelligent and clever. So the other side of this intelligence is that it can be pretty cold. Very intellectual. See, all the Jews, they have been, you know, so intellectual. But it can be pretty cold at times. On the other side, Arabs are extremely passionate. And in that passion, anything is possible for them. So you have these two uh, kind of forces which are balancing each other. Um, so once again the disciples ask, A few days ago I said something about Muslims and Israelites and F noted it down. This is with regard to Prithvi um, Singh Nahar's uh, conversation. But I have not taken it down because Mother herself said the effect it had on me, all the life is gone from it at any rate. So if one were to quote it, you will not actually capture the real state that the mother meant to say. So she laughs. Here it is anyways. So then she says something interesting. The Muslims and Israelites represent two religions in which faith in God is the most extreme. Only the Israelites' faith is in an impersonal God, while the Muslims' faith is in a personal God. So for them, it's like a con command which they received and uh, this impersonal God governs the whole thing. For the Muslims, it was one particular prophet who received the command and he gave it to others. So very often when Muslims would concede to the people of Israel, they would say people of the book. And sometimes even to Indians, they have conceded like that. Okay, we will call them people of the book. So they are people of the book, but we are the Inheritors of God. So this is how the claims and counterclaims went. And then she says their enmity perhaps exists only because they are neighbours. I should add that it was a reply to a letter. B wrote to ask me all kinds of questions in particular. That curse on the Jews is a Christian story. It has nothing to do with the Muslims. 
violence and enmity when brothers hate each other they do so much more intensely than others do and we see this kind of relationship very interestingly that if, uh, every time the israelites conquered the what is called as a palestine area which itself is a big question mark so they actually looked after them even till date so many people on gaza they they were working here their lives they had really uh, made it better in many ways like an elder brother looking after the younger brother so it is very strange that they took care again we have the story of the pandavas and the uh, kauravas so there are so many parallels one can draw in this story uh, shurbindo said hatred denotes the possibility of a much greater love so let us hope that a much greater love actually comes in and uh, hopefully it it will come in but it requires a sea change because love is the ultimate victor so she says the arabs have a passionate nature they live almost exclusively in the vital and its passions and desires while the israelites live mostly in the mind with a great power of organization and realization something quite exceptional the israelites are intellectuals with an exceptional will they are not sentimental that is to say they don't like weakness so this is a weakness this sentimental weakness and impulsivity and passion which is what the arab world is about now i'll take a lot of either how they can change is either through an education which intellectualizes them so we see that many of them like the recent certain changes in saudi arabia because they have received a kind of education but much of the muslim world has refused a kind of education they have continued the madrasa teaching and it's a, as long as madrasas continue there is no hope of really uh, their change because it's going to kill their own capacity and possibility of evolution so it was a good idea to give them quran in one hand and uh, computer in another and if you have to make a choice give them computers because quran is in arabic most of them don't understand anyways so otherwise many of them may even reject many of the aspects of the teachings but it is only through a universal education see how it happened with the christian world it went through a rational phase but here you are dealing with a group who are passionate in faith extremely sentimental and reason is almost it it doesn't uh, apply it, it it doesn't work like look let's be reasonable let's uh, you know talk it over so she makes it very clear the muslims are impulsive the israelites are reasonable so we must understand that it's not just as simple as the jews and the palestine there is the whole muslim world which is behind it and they're capable of doing things which you can't imagine and uh, with the nuclear bombs and armament uh, all around one has, one has to understand that this conflict cannot be resolved unless you understand and address the roots and the roots has to be addressed by whom by the muslim world they have to look into their own scriptures understand that you know well it has become dated and take the good things if you wish to take the good things if you think this is the ultimate thing and move on move forward whether it will happen or not only they can tell it cannot happen by anybody else is saying because each group has to look within like within india what happened to hindus we changed ourselves by looking inside nobody needed to tell us actually uh, whether it sati pratha so called um, well i am whether it dowry in the more recent example well we changed we discovered we, we thought about it we had our own reason rational way of looking at it many other things parda all this is gone because uh, we understood that there was a context to it and it's no more necessary uh, maybe say in some extreme places people may practice it Uh, women going out for work we understood this we moved on with time without discarding our roots so that's how the change must take place so reform has to come from within islam and some kind of a reform one can see is beginning there are pockets but the rest of it is so virulent and violent so it has to be seen whether reform wins or the extreme uh, attitude approach wins so when one of the things which is being discussed is whether this conflict is going to melt down into a third world war and going to decide the stake at civilization no this conflict has roots in the past uh, but as far as future is concerned what will decide is the conflict which is yet to come and that is india 
because India is the center where these things, these are all skirmishes going all around, preparing the ground for the future. So she says, this is not the conflict that will decide the future of our civilization. And then the mother says, he ended his letter with this conflict which must decide the present civilization. Somebody who wrote to her, so she said, this is not the conflict which is going to decide the future of the civilization. So what is going to decide that conflict will be in India. And that conflict, to my intuitive sense, will be within India, rather than India with neighbors. Because this, within India, it will become very subtle and very difficult. You see, when you have a visible, tangible enemy, it's easy. You know where to... But when you have the enemy within, it is the most difficult and dangerous thing, and one of the things which... Uh, my um, uh, one of our uh, I was going to say friend yes friend he treated me like a friend Chutna Ranji used to say he says during the time of Ram the good people were on this side and the bad people guys were in uh, Sri Lanka uh, well that time Lanka during the time of uh, Krishna they were in the same kul and in Sri time they are in the same heart and that is why we see that there is an awakening of Sanatan Dharma and once in Sanatan Dharma, we discover a way, which is the beautiful way for the future, you will see that all these conflicts begin to get resolved. This is what India is facing right now. And based on how we... Now here again, we have two extreme thoughts. One is a post-modern thought. No, no, all this is meaningless. All that Sanatan Dharma has no meaning. And there is the other thought, which is rigidly holding on to a past forms of life, past ways of life. And we have to keep the spirit of the past intact, but build new forms for the future. It cannot be done unless we live in our consciousness the Aryan thought. That's how Shivinda put it. It's not enough to pay lip service to the Vedas. We have to open the Veda within us and live the Aryan thought, the Aryan way of life, the Aryan discipline. We have to become like that. And that's the next phase which is going to be worked out. Once you have that, by its mere presence and that's what is going towards a new race ultimately. Once you have that, automatically by its mere presence, it will have a cascading effect upon humanity. So this last conflict will be played out subtly, but much more dangerously because of that. So, the mother gives these two messages. At present, the working is going on with direct supramental force. Its immediate action on the world of selfishness, strife and disharmony so this is where the struggle will be. It is not encouraging. We see everywhere clashes. The world is going on in the old way as usual. Perhaps worse, one is reminded of the old legend that the first thing that arose from the churning of ocean of life was poison. Nectar came last. The action now looks to be similar. India is going on in the same old way placating Pakistan and the Muslims and Russians. This is not mother's saying, but it was shown to the mother. Okay. And then the person says that uh, person is the disciple with whom the mother was communicating in the agenda. And it's a write-up. And the, it has been seen by the mother. Mother has, uh, uh, she's remained silent. She has not said yes, she has not said no. But she has seen through it. Mother's reply thus in English. It looks evident that if the transformation undertaken could be achieved in its totality, the necessity of another world war would not no more exist. And then this very beautiful thing. All the countries live in falsehood. If only one country stood courageously for truth, the world might be saved. So this is where one country has to purge itself clean of all falsehood, which is going to be that country. Toward the end of the day when I was alone, mother, I began asking Sherbindo precisely what he meant. Sherbindo has said this. She dictated, he dictated it through the mother to an Israeli disciple, not a disciple but a seeker, who asked this question. 
And the mother said, all the countries right now live in falsehood. And she said, I didn't tell him that it was Shurabindo who spoke. And so she says, I began asking Shurabindo precisely what he meant. Naturally, his hope is that the country that stood for truth will be India. For the moment, she is very far from it. This is 1967. But, and since the subject was before me, I asked him how he saw the terrestrial possibility in a harmonious future. Why the mother is not forcing? Because she is right here, down here fighting the battle. <laughs> Shubindo is working from the other side. Then he said to me, it was very simple, very clear. A federation of all nations and countries without exception. All continents, single federation. The federation of all human nations of the earth. So UNO is also going to pass away, like the League of Nations. Something else will come. Though it has the name of United Nations Organization. But it has not lived up to its, you know, uh, the hope, its name. And a group, a governing group, consisting of one representative from each country. The most able man from the standpoint of political and economic organization. And nothing of the proportional question that would give large countries many representations and small one, only one, one representative for each country. Because each country represents one aspect of the problem and they would sit in rotation. She gave a very clear future roadmap from the United Nations organization. No vetoes, we know now. And each country, one representative, which need not be the uh, head of the state. But the person who is, it's like Auroville, that's how Auroville is meant to be. It was a vast vision, not so much with words as with a vision. That's where things stand today. And then there's the discussion of the Suez Canal crisis, which was Egyptian. They connived and they said, we will not allow if Brits have to go and if Israel, Israel of course was helpless. So if Brits have to go and Americans go through it, they have to pay, I forget how much, 10 times the tax for entry. So it was practically like not possible. Then the Americans said, we will pay it. They said, no, no, we won't allow you at all, finally. So it was a crisis situation because it means the ships have to come to Israel through a very big way. So it was a way to actually <laughs> block Israel but through a roundabout way. So she says that uh, all this is happening and she gives says this is the sign of the pressure of consciousness. And uh, let me come back to that final things. Yeah. Three days ago now, this is the disciple telling her, Nasir dis declared that he wanted the destruction of Israel wiped off the map, which we know that Nasir is the one who brought back all these issues in Egypt in a very, and then the brotherhood and all that came. Yes, that's it. But three years ago, they declared that Israel shouldn't exist. So, you know, mark mother's words. So, that clearly puts them in the wrong. Now, here there is no ambiguity. If you say that a nation has no right to exist, which is what the charter is, incidentally. If you read through the charter of the Hamas, it's very clear. So, you may have peace. All these ideas of peace are basically to keep the ulcer become chronic. Is there in the charter? You, you call peace, you will give aid, same thing will happen. So, there has to be a decisive action one way or the other. So, she says that, so that clearly puts them in the wrong. I don't know how the others replied. The whole world lives in falsehood without a doubt. But one thing must be established in an absolute way. The right of each nation or country to individual existence. Provided it doesn't interfere in another nation's right. So, this she has should be put in bold letters. Because we can discuss and debate all that she has written from this standpoint, that standpoint. So, she says, but one thing must be established in an absolute way. The right of each nation or country to individual existence, provided it doesn't interfere, there is a proviso there, in another nation's right. That should be the base. 
Then she says, of course, they will start arguing. But at that time, things were like that. At that time, they were like this. And in the past, this was ours. In the past, endless arguments. So there should be a higher vision, which is a balanced and just and deep vision of things that can say, this is how it is. Otherwise, there would be an indefinite source of arguments. And then she, there is a silence. Now comes the penultimate crux. There is a group in the new Indian parliament, 1967. I leave it to everybody's imagination. There is a group in the new Indian parliament, a group of people dissatisfied with the position taken by India. Indians were with the Palestinians. We don't know at that time. Okay. Who have declared their wish to act according to sure been those ideal and instructions. And they have asked if we could send someone from here to hold conference in, since in Delhi. It's a group. Naturally not the whole parliament. It's something to be envisaged. But the difficulty is to find the someone because it should be a man who knows Sri thoroughly to begin with, who is capable of receiving his inspirations directly and has at the same time a very strong character with a power, a contagious power and a force that can arouse the inert masses. For years I have been looking for that man without finding him. Then she says something very interesting. There was a man who would have done, not fully well, not with enough breadth of mind to fully understand Sri Aurobindo, but very straight and strong. He was assassinated in Kashmir. Shama Prashad Mukherjee. <laughs> but it was declared, it is a very sad story. Even his, um, his wife, her letter has come out. She was not allowed to go and visit him. His letters were all kept. They were not, not allowed within India from Kashmir to be dispatched to the family in Delhi, if I am not mistaken, or maybe Kolkata, I, I don't remember now. So he was actually assassinated. Mother has said this. Though it was said, no, no, he had some tuberculosis and he was uh, taken to the hospital where he died. But in all likelihood, it was a poisoning. He is the one who came here when we wanted to have a conference for the opening of the university. He presided over it. A rather tall man and strong. I forget his name. He is Shama Prashad Mukherjee. We will see his photograph also in the inauguration of. But it was in Kashmir that he was assassinated. Not officially, of course, he fell ill. It wasn't perfect. It was a stopgap. But anyway, he would have done. But now, among the young people whom I don't know, what is needed is power combined with the breath of mind, capable of understanding Sri inspiration and transmitting it. And along with that, vital power, the two things together, Shakti, Durga. And it's not something for tomorrow, it's for right now. That's the problem. Because the danger is there. I leave it to the mind of people's imagination or reflection. What was that group which wanted to follow the ideals of Sri Aurobindo in the parliament at that point of time? We can look up to our own searches. And who was that person? Syama Prashad Mukherjee. It's very easy to know who he was. I leave it to everybody's Imagination and Reflection. Namaste.